Okay, so we've been looking at the plumb line series over the last almost two months now. And we see that God has a holy, righteous standard. And the scripture speaks of the plumb line many times. The Lord holds a plumb line in his hand. And by that he will judge and test. And he comes up, uh, you know, you see the Lord with a plumb line coming into Jerusalem. And he's judging and testing Jerusalem. He, we see uh, that he comes to the people in the Holy Land. And he judges and tests. Are they uh, true to plumb? Which means... Are they righteous? Are they in accordance with his standard? And, and in the plumb line, it releases two things. It releases, number one, a judgment on those things that are not in line with him. But it also is a realignment so that we fall into alignment with him, which leads to restoration. So on one side, everything that's not like him has to be judged and it has to be dealt with so that we can become more and more like Him. Yeah. That we become more and more like the person that God has created us to be. Yeah. And, and so that is actually the positive side of judgments is God's judging because He's wanting to wipe away, you know, the refiner's fire, He's burning away the dross, He's burning away the garbage to purify us. And so the plumb line is God's holy and righteous standard which is seen in Jesus Christ. It's revealed through the Word of God. And then we've been looking at one side, we were looking at the whole issue of rejection. And all of the rejection based issues where people have flight personalities and they flight, they flee and they pull back and they hide with shame and guilt. And this is all based in inferior pride. And most people don't see inferiority as pride, but the scripture actually teaches that inferior pride is a reality because it's not truth. Yeah. And humility is actually the truth of God according to God's opinion about us. And yes, we're sinners, that's a truth. And if you've sinned, you're a sinner, that's a truth. But we're also born again sons of God. We're create new creation sons of God. We're destined to rule and reign with Jesus. And so the truths of God, there is a truth of where we've fallen short, but there's also a truth of uh, the person that we're born again to be and the potential that we have, etc. And so people can swing in their lives to re rejection, inferior pride sort of issues and guilt and shame and all of that sort of stuff. Or they swing in the other opposite direction to becoming rebellion based issues, pride and arrogance, manipulation and... Uh, all of the other things that go on there, superiority pride is what's that's there. And that's what we usually look at as pride, as superior pride. When you look down on others. Inferior pride is when you look down on yourself, and it's not actually the truth of who you are. Yeah. Superior pride is it's not the truth of who you are. You think you're better than what you are, and then you look down on everybody else. Because actually our standards shouldn't be ourselves. Our standards should be God and Jesus. Yeah. We all fall short because we looked at that last week. All fall short of the glory of God. And so these are the fight people. Their personalities, the, they, they always want to fight. They want to confront. They can be arrogant. And they're the abusers. The rejection-based people in life become the abused. And they abuse themselves, by the way. Mm. You don't need other people to abuse you. You can abuse yourself by self-condemnation and self-accusation. And these people, they become the abusers of others. And... Um, then we started to look at last week, the most deceptive of all the syndromes is called the good works people. And they deceive themselves by their good works and they think they're good. And you know, the rich young ruler comes to Jesus and he says, good teacher, what must I do to be saved? And then Jesus answers back, why do you call me good? There's no one good. <laughs> In Romans it says, there's none good, no, not one. There's none righteous, no, not one. We all fall short of the glory of God. And the problem with the good works syndrome, and this is where we get the Pharisaic stronghold that we looked at a couple of months ago, and we'll be looking a little bit more at that today. The sin of the Pharisees is based in their self-righteousness. Yeah. Self-righteous pride. And our righteousness is in Christ Jesus. So we saw last week, 
Those who boast should not boast in themselves. We should boast in the Lord. Because it's the Lord who saves us and it's the Lord that uh, is the one that changes us and transforms us. And our boasting and our praise should be in the Lord. But often with self-righteous pride, our boasting and our praise is of ourselves. And it's very deceptive because uh, you can be doing all of the religious good works and you can be someone that prays fervently, that you attend uh, church services regularly, you give to the poor, you make sacrifice um, to give to the Lord in tithes and offerings above and beyond everybody else. And then you walk puffed up in pride about the whole thing. And that's why Isaiah says, your righteousness before God is like filthy rags. You're running around thinking it's awesome and God looks at you and it's the file thing. Okay, so we want to continue to look at the, the good work syndrome based in self-righteous pride. And they also, in a sense, become... Uh, they're, they're either moving in the superior pride issue of their good works, so they just run around praising themselves all the time, and then they look down on everybody else, and they, they judge them and, and abuse them through that type of judgment. Or some of these good works people are actually in the rejection thing, where they're actually uh, self-sacrificing themselves so much that they're causing themselves self-abuse. And we looked at that last week, that there's some people and they're making so much self-sacrifice in their life for Jesus and others, they're actually abusing themselves and they don't have self-care. And that they can actually be sacrificing their marriage on God, on, not God's altar, on the altar of ministry. Yeah. They sacrifice their children on the altar of ministry. Ministry is not a God. Yeah. God is God. And ministry is something we do for God. And then we saw last week from the book of Ephesians chapter 2 that we are saved by God's grace through faith. We have to do something. There is a work. We have to have faith. Hmm. We have to have faith in Him and His finished work and have faith in Him that He continues by His Spirit and grace to work in our lives yeah. and He'll continue to change and transform us. And so we're saved by His grace through faith, but not of ourselves. It's not of our flesh works. So the problem here is fleshly works, works in the flesh. It's not in the spirit. And it goes on, you know, uh, lest, lest we boast in our good works so that no one can boast. And it goes on, however, we are the workmanship of God in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared beforehand for us to do. And if you study the New Testament, before the very creation of the universe, the foundations, God knew you and God has prepared you for good works. So good works don't save us, but we're born again to do good works. And so when you see a, someone claiming to be a born again, spirit-filled Christian, but their life is not changing, I'm not saying they're perfect, none of us are perfect. But if you don't see them becoming more and more like the Lord, if you don't see change, and if you don't see them pressing into God, then there's something to be concerned about. Jesus said, by their fruit, you know them. Yeah. You know, because I remember on the mission field, they used to always say to me when I'm trying to talk to them about sin issues in their life, and they say, stop judging me. You don't know my heart. And I said, well, Jesus said, I can know your heart by your works, by your fruit. And fruit's not just the works, it's dealing with the attitudes in which we do work. Yeah. 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 And so the works that the Lord is looking for is number one, by faith. And the key of faith, it says in the book of Romans, faith comes by hearing the word of God. In other words, God is speaking to us by His Spirit and through His Word. And by His Spirit and through His Word, He's guiding and leading us to do certain things. And we should only ever do what He leads us to do. But the problem is that we're often doing a lot of things that God has never asked us to do. Yeah. Therefore, we don't have the grace of God to do it. Mm. And that's why, you know, the rejection syndrome people, if they don't deal with their issues, it ends up leading to suicide. Yeah. First, it's, a, it's emotional suicide and the suicide of their joy and the suicide of their faith. 
and, there's, and the suicide of their peace, and then, and then they have death wishes, and then finally they actually commit suicide if they don't deal with that syndrome. The rebellion people ends up in murder, and before they actually kill someone, they start killing them with their tongue, and killing them with their attitude, but, and in the end they end up killing somebody. This one, they burn out. Because they're so caught up, they find their identity in their works. Your identity yeah, is supposed yeah. to be where the workmanship of God in Christ Jesus. Our identity is not in who we are in the flesh, who we are in the past. Our identity is in who Jesus is, and in and through Jesus, our relationship with the Father. Our identity is in Jesus, and it's based faith relationship with God through Jesus. That's our identity. Okay, And when you find your identity in your works, when you're going really good, then you start boasting and praising yourself and you feel awesome and look down on everybody else. And when you're not looking very good, when you're not doing really good in life, you swing to this rejection person, you get all depressed. Woe is me and I don't want to get out of bed in the morning because I'm not worth anything, I'm un unworthy am I? And all that sort of you know, self-pity party breaks out. Okay, good work syndrome. So let's have a look at some scriptures here. Matthew 11. Let's start with Matthew 11. So today is actually the Good Work Syndrome Part 2. And I'm going to look a little bit deeper into some of the concepts that I introduced last week. So we're in the book of Matthew chapter 11. Verse 28 through to 30. It's the words of Jesus. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. And, I will, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is yoke. Light, sorry, yoke. My burden is light. So the key here is dealing with a thing we call yoking. So what happens with yoking is they would get the mature, strong ox that is experienced in the work that it needs to do in submitting to its master and it bears the yoke and plows the field in submission and it stays in the field that it's called into okay and so then you get the young immature ox that is not been out there working in the fields for years he gets yoked to this very strong mature ox and then the young ox, he pulls and he tugs, but the thing is, he's not strong enough. And the stronger ox keeps pulling him back on track and pulling him back on track. And the other thing that happens is this. When they're yoked together, there is hard work in plowing of fields. And sometimes when they plow the fields, they have to actually pull up trees by the roots and pull huge boulder stones out of the ground and there's some very heavy lifting work to prepare the field for the harvest yeah. and that young little whippersnapper ox that thinks he's pretty awesome isn't strong enough to do the work because he hasn't built up his muscles but not just that he hasn't learned endurance mm. and he's like the the flash in the pan, you know, like the seed that enters the ground and it pops up really fast and hallelujah, praise the Lord, I'm God's gift to everything. And uh, and then suddenly the sun comes out, persecution, hardship, and everything withers up and dies. Yeah. And they, they come out with all their, their, their self-praise and here I am and I'm going to change the church and the church really needs me and all this sort of stuff. And then... And so you get the young ox yoked to the strong ox because the, the stronger ox, the old ox, knows endurance. It knows a thing called long-suffering. You'll find that in the King James Bible. I love that word. Long-suffering. Because there is a certain sacrifice. There is a certain suffering in the process. 
that goes on. But the thing is, when you're yoked together to a very, very strong ox, and we can think of it, what does it mean if you're yoked to Jesus Christ? Mm. Like spiritually, you're not going to get someone more powerful than that. Yeah. And you talk about overcoming demonic powers and principalities and conquering the mountains and conquering the giants of life. If you are yoked to Jesus, what happens is the stronger ox would carry the lion's share of the weight. It would pull the lion's share of the, the hard job to do. And the young ox is coming along going like, well, look what I just did, you know? Um, but the thing was, it's because it's yoked. Yes. So this is the thing we're talking about with the good work syndrome. is when we are trying to do the good works of God in our flesh, which means another way of saying flesh translated in the Bible is the word self. And another word is pride all connected together. So what is pride? Well, pride is being self-centered and self-sufficient. I'm not into self-confidence. You know, like self-confidence is going to let you down in the end. Mm. Yeah. Okay? When David faced Goliath, it was all about self-confidence. He was finished because Goliath is a giant. Yeah. David didn't have self-confidence. He had a thing called God-confidence. And what's that? Faith. Yeah. He was doing a work of faith he says, I don't come against you with sword and spear and javelin. I'm coming against you with the name of the Lord of the angel armies. And you don't know who you're dealing with today because it's not me. It's the Lord of the angel armies. And I'm yoked together with him. And this little tiny stone in my sling is going to wipe you out because of him. Yeah. It's in his name. See, when you start to find your identity in him and you're yoked to him, the overcoming, conquering of situations becomes a lot easier. But, you know, the devil always wants us to look back at this guy, ourselves. And he'll remind you of your past. He'll remind you of your faults. He'll remind you of your weakness. So then you just remind him of his past and it's then remind him of his future. <laughs> Jesus conquered you and defeated you at the cross and you're headed for hell fire. Yeah. Amen? Amen. So Jesus is saying a couple of very interesting things here in Matthew 11. And he says, okay, so there are these people in life and they're laboring. Laboring is, you get the sense out of that word in the Greek, it's someone that's carrying heavy burdens. You're doing hard work. This is difficult things I need to do. And I'm being weighed down. I'm getting tired. I'm getting worn out. Okay. So if you're like that in any situation where you feel that you're burning out, you feel that you do not have what it takes, you need to learn how to yoke to Jesus because you're trying to do it yourself, yeah. number one. Number two, you need to ask this question. It's extremely important. Did the Lord ask me to do this? Because I can tell you, Jesus won't yoke himself to you to do things that the Father has not asked him to ask you to do. Because Jesus, he said, I only ever do what the Father asked me to do. So do you expect that Jesus is going to do stuff you want him to do? If the Father hasn't said? Something to meditate on. We, we all think of you know, Jesus like a Santa Claus and we ask him for everything. And he gives us what we want. And then we get all bitter and frustrated and angry when he doesn't give us what we really want. Then we leave church and don't come back. <laughs> I'm serious. I've seen it happen over and over again. Get bitter and resentful at God because He never gave you what you want. And He said, well, I never promised to give it to you in the first place. Mm -hmm. So here is the key. Again, listen. God the Father will lead Jesus to speak to you by the Holy Spirit what you should and shouldn't do. What commitments should you make? Now, once you've made a commitment, and if God's led you to make a commitment, follow through with that commitment. Yes, there will still be some sacrifice, but because you're yoked to Jesus, He will enable you to finish what you start. Yeah. So number one is, are you doing what God's asked you to do, or are you doing something else? And I shared last week something an old missionary shared with me on the mission field that really helped me, because I went through a burnout on the mission field, because I was pushing myself too hard. And he said to me, Glenn, God will give you this much time and this much energy and this much anointing to do everything he has asked you to do. And it's sufficient. Mm. 
But if you start doing these things, you'll use up this much time and energy to do things he's never asked you to do. Yeah. So you've only got this much left to do to what you're supposed to be doing. And that's why we burn out. That's why we can't finish what God asked us to do. Because we've been distracted by, like Martha, we've been distracted by all the work that needs to be done. And Jesus, you know, another time Jesus says, the poor you'll have with you always. Yeah. You know, yes, serve the poor. And that's in the Bible, by the way, serve the poor, help the poor. But you can't give everything to the poor that you become poor. Mm. And then you're one of the poor people that other people have to come in and help you out. Well, you're helping the sick so much that you become sick and now that everyone else has got to help you out because you're so sick and you can't help yourself anymore. You know what I'm talking about? Self-harm. Mm. Because you're doing things. You're investing finances into, into projects that God never asked you to invest finances into. And then you wonder why you get into trouble and debt and you don't have money to pay for your rent or something like that. And God says, well, I gave you all the finances that you need. You have not stewarded it according to my wisdom of my spirit. So he'll give you everything you need. That's his promise that. Yeah. Gives us everything we need, but doesn't promise to give us everything we want. And so, you know, you spend all your money on these things and, it's, and they're not really what you needed. And then you've got this much left for what you really need and now you're in trouble. Yeah. And it's not just money. We're dealing with our time. We're dealing with our energy in life. And so this is really, it's, it's a... A wisdom type message because self-harm will be what goes on here and so Jesus is is saying this okay if you labor if you're heavy laden I promise to give you rest and that words very interesting rest because one of the reasons that people burn out and they say up to 10% of Christian ministers in Australia are presently out of ministry because of burnout a large percentage of missionaries leave the mission field and a large percentage because they have burned out. They, they have been burning the candle at both ends, so to speak. And they've not been sleeping at night. They've been getting up super early in the morning. They've been making so much financial sacrifice. They're not eating good food. They end up starting to get sick. And then they burn out because all of their emotional and spiritual energy has been burned out doing things that God never asked them to do and they've forgotten the command of the Sabbath. Now I don't care if you do it on a, from a Friday evening to the Saturday evening, which was the Jewish Sabbath, or you do it on a Sunday, but we need to put into our life cycle of activity time of quality rest. If you're working seven days a week and you're just, you know, work, 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 you will burn out. Yeah. But I need more money. I don't have enough money. Well, I'll tell you what, if you burn out because you are so sick and everything falls apart with you, then you're not going to have any money whatsoever because you're not going to be able to go to work, work full stop. Yeah. This is how these things work. This is how this good work syndrome, it, it's, you know, in Egypt, it's very interesting if you look at the symbolic language that's going on in, in Exodus chapter 1, God's people are there in Egypt. So Egypt speaks of the fallen world system. You know, we're all going to live in a fallen world system, right? Yeah. We're not yet in heaven. Anyone in heaven yet? Like, heaven's in our heart. And when you're really in Christ, you kind of start to experience heaven on earth in, in certain ways. Amen? But we're living in the earth. Let's be really realistic yeah. here. And so here's God's people in Egypt. And they're under Pharaoh. Pharaoh represents, ultimately, he's actually called Leviathan by the prophets. Leviathan is a picture of Satan, the dragon. And so here is this man who represents Satan with his demonic powers in his demonic kingdom. And, and here we are, the people of God having to live in a system like that. And he feared the people of God. So he gets all of his generals and his commanders together and says, we've got to be really shrewd in how we work with these people because if my enemy comes to attack this kingdom, they could actually rise up and join that enemy and defeat us. That's like Satan going, well, if Jesus really invades Australia, 
<laughs> Wouldn't that be awesome? <laughs> now, if Jesus really invades Brisbane, oh, I'm really praying for that one. Yeah. But you know why we won't join Jesus, most Christians? Because we've fallen into the trap of flesh-driven good works. Jesus, by the way, he's come a lot of times to Brisbane and he's only had a small army join him because the rest of them have been running around doing what they were doing in his Exodus chapter 1. You know what it was? We're going to be shrewd with how we work with these people lest they rise up and take over when our enemy attacks. So he put over them slave masters. And it's interesting, there's a play, word play with the Hebrew, debt slave masters. We're going to bind them up in financial debt. And through financial debt, we're going to drive them into slavery. And so the, the enemy has slave masters because wherever there is flesh, nature in our life, our flesh nature is always in agreement with the powers of darkness. It's our born again spirit nature that's in agreement with God. Because the spirit of God and our born again spirit are in agreement, but when we're in the flesh, our flesh is always in agreement with the powers of darkness. And so the slave masters manipulate us like puppeteers through our flesh. Our carnal, fleshly desires, whatever they are. And so that they put these slave masters over, I say the people of God so you can relate it to yourself. They're, they're the Hebrews, but I'm not a Hebrew. But anyway, the people of God. And you know what he did? This is interesting. You read Exodus chapter 1. And he forced them to build his treasure cities. That's the Hebrew. Some Bibles translate it, he caused them to build his stronghold cities. And we've been learning about strongholds on Wednesday night. Demonic strongholds by which the enemy gets a stronghold on people. So he causes the people of God to build his strongholds. Satan causing God's people to build his strongholds to keep a stronghold on God's people so they don't rise up and join Jesus when Jesus wants to come and conquer. Think about this language. See, this is why this good work syndrome. You're doing all of these good things. You know, here's the Pharisees. You know, like Jesus said, you know, do what do what they say when they teach you. They're teaching all of this really good stuff, but don't do what they actually do. Mm. Especially don't do what they do when people aren't looking. Because when everyone's looking, it's like they're they're really holy and they're awesome and you know and they pray these amazing prayers. But when people aren't looking. And so those, those Pharisees were so caught up in this stuff, they were blind to where they were in error. They're going, they're looking down on Jesus because Jesus has been a friend of sinners. You know, you're with those dirty, rotten sinners, and they didn't realize that they were the worst. See, because self righteous pride, religious pride, comes into play. So in Egypt, there was that scenario that they were all kept in bondage, but the thing was, they started to cry out and God heard the cry and he rendered the heavens and he came down. Because in the midst of their suffering, they started to really cry out to God. And then God did invade Egypt by raising up a deliverer called Moses, who is a picture of Jesus. And he came in. But you know, when Moses did come in, all hell broke loose, right? In Egypt. All hell broke loose. And so the people of God started turning on Moses because the... Slave masters started to increase the burden of their work. You ever wonder why things get worse before they get better? Especially when you start to say, I'm going to really rise up. I'm going to honor God. I'm going to do it God's way. I'm not going to be driven by the slave driver to build the treasure cities of this world. I am going to make sure that I put quality of time aside, a Sabbath that I will be in the presence of the Lord and that I'll wait upon the Lord so that I can be spiritually, emotionally and physically energized that I can get back out there and do the good works that God wants me to do. And so the, the, the thing is, the good work syndrome is 
they find it very hard to rest because you never actually have time. I can't afford to rest. I need more money. Mm. There's more responsibility. I can't afford to rest because I've got another project I want to do. Sometimes it's not money. It's just, you know, I just want to do another project. It's kind of like the Messiah mentality. Part of the good work syndrome is a thing called the Messiah mentality. And, you know, Jesus is the Messiah. You're not. Christian means little Messiah, by the way. So we're little Messiahs in the sense that when we're yoked to Him, yeah. we become like Him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Hey, some of you, I've, I've taught this before in regards to the Hebrew calendar, right? Some very interesting things. The Hebrews, the numbers all have meaning. It's really amazing. So Avav is the number six. That's why 666 is the number of a man, the beast. Six is the number of man. has many other meanings. Seven is a vav, a man that has a crown, which means he's the Messiah, the anointed one. So here you've got an ordinary human being, and here you have the anointed one of God, the Messiah, and that's number six, that's number seven. Now number eight is really interesting, because number eight is when you actually yoke the ordinary man to the Messiah, and it becomes... An open gate of kingdom opportunity. How's that? Because when you get yoked to the Messiah, His anointing comes on you. So this is why it's really important that, God, what is it you're calling me into and what is it you're not calling me into? And by the way, even if you're doing the right thing, you've got to make sure you're doing the right thing at the right time. Okay? Okay? And then you've got to make sure that you're doing the right thing at the right time with the right attitude. Because yeah. most people think, uh, being in the will of God, we always focus on, am I in the right place? You know, does God want me in Brisbane or does God want me in China or does God want me in Africa? You know, we always think geographically, right? Can I tell you, more than geography is attitude. That's it. Yeah. Because I can tell you, If you've got a dirty, rotten attitude and you haven't learned how to be yoked to Jesus and how to work together with Him, Jesus said to the Pharisees, you know, you Pharisees, you go over land and sea to this other nation to make people into converts, then you turn them into twice the son of hell as what you are. Wow, how would you like to be that missionary? No, serious, Jesus said this. This is Jesus preaching going on. Because what he's dealing with was this. You could be at the right place, even at the right time, but if your attitude is not aligned, if you don't have that yeah. genuine faith attitude, if you don't have that yieldedness and surrender to God's will. Because the whole thing of pride, pride resists the will of God. Pride is, I want to do it my way, in my time, thank you very much. And pride, by the way, says, God, God said, so I'm doing it. It's one of the first things. Oh, God told me to do it. of the time when Christians tell me God told them to do something and then I look at their life and how everything didn't work, I know exactly that God is themselves. And by the way, I look at the mirror and I'm talking to that guy. I've done it. God told me. God never told me. (laughs) I deceived myself that I am God and I did it. Or I should say I deceived myself that the voice of my will is God. Do you understand what I'm saying here? Yeah. yeah. So this is subtle. This is, you know, Jesus, he, he wasn't just dealing with the outside behaviors of people. You know, you know, you've heard it said that if you murder someone, you've sinned. Well, I say to you, if you hate someone, you kill them before God. It's like, man, it's like, man, it's, now I don't even murder people. And he's looking at me like a murderer. <laughs> but what he's doing is he's saying, I want to go and look at the innermost man. I want to look at your attitude I want to look at your motivation. I want to look at your heart. And by the way, if you're at the right, wrong place at the wrong time, but your heart's right and your motivation's right and you're really aligned with me, I can use you in the wrong place at the wrong time. Right. <laughs> yeah. Did you catch that? Yeah. Because if you know how to yoke with Jesus and you're at the wrong place at the wrong time, I'll tell you what, if anything, he'll deliver you out of that situation. Yeah, so anyways, things to meditate on. This is what this is... See, this is a a really subtle teaching. This is why I wanted to wait a while before I got into it. Because the Pharisees didn't get this stuff. 
And then Jesus was sitting in the boat one day. He's about to go to the other side. You know, come with me in the boat. We're going to go to the other side, Jesus says to us. And he's got all of these future apostles of the church sitting in the boat. And then Jesus says, beware the leaven of the Pharisees. And they all look at each other and go, oh my goodness. Did you bring the bread? Did you bring lunch? Did you bring the bread? Oh, we forgot the bread. And Jesus understood what they were saying amongst themselves, you know. They're thinking Jesus is upset because they forgot to bring some bread. And Jesus said, you know, I fed the 5,000 men plus women plus children with just this little tiny bit of food. I multiplied a little bit of bread. I'm not, in, I'm not interested in bread. You forget bread, you know, bring on a stone, I can turn it to bread. You know, as long as the devil doesn't say, you can do it. When the devil told Jesus to do it, he wouldn't do it. But bread's not the issue. He said, he said, I'm talking about the leaven of the Pharisees. And then suddenly they understood. He's talking about the teaching and the example of the scribes and the Pharisees. Mm. See, Jesus is prophetically, apostolically speaking to the church that's sitting in his boat, the church of all time. The leaven of the Pharisees is going to try to infiltrate my church in history. And you're either going to be a Jesus person or you're going to be a Pharisee. Guard your hearts. And all of us, I think all of us have in our flesh, there's a little Pharisee and a little Jesus. The, 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 the born again Jesus nature and the old fleshly nature. It's warring. Galatians. The desire of the flesh is at an enmity with the desire of the spirit. And they war with each other within us. We've got to learn how to put to death the desires of our flesh. Let's have a look at Matthew chapter 23, verse 17 to 28. I really think it's interesting. Matthew 24 is Jesus talks about the end times. And everyone gets into that because we're all interested in the end times, right? And it's one of the most detailed descriptions of how the end time dynamics will unfold. That's Matthew 24. Matthew 23 comes right before it, and it's all about woe to the scribes and the Pharisees. And I think it's important that those two messages go together. Mm. Woe to the scribes and the Pharisees. And I'm not going to read the whole chapter. I just want to look at a couple of the verses here, verse 17 through to 28. Okay. You are fools and you are blind. Well, you know, don't say anything Jesus wouldn't say. You are fools and you are blind, for which is greater, the gold of the temple that sanctifies the gold, or the temple itself. And he goes on, whoever swears by the altar is nothing, but whoever swears by the gift that's on the altar is obliged to perform it. So they're, they're so interested in the gold, that's really important, but actually the important thing was the temple of God where worship takes place. Yeah. But they made the, the treasure the important thing. And, and it goes on, starting with verse 23 now. Why do you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites? So a hypocrite is what? It means in the Greek language, a hypocrite is someone that is wearing a mask in a drama or a play. Someone who is pretending to be someone or something they are not. And he's looking at the Pharisees going, you know what? You guys wear a mask. You're pretending to be someone and something that you are not. But I see the real you going on here. Okay. And we all want Jesus to appear and talk to us, right? Now, sometimes it'll be nice stuff and sometimes it might scare us a little bit what Jesus actually says. He says, you, you pay the tithe of men and and uh, the cumin, and you've neglected the weightier matters of the law. He goes on, you blind guys, you strain out the gnat and swallow the camel. And then in 25, woe to you, scribes and hypocrites, scribes and Pharisees and hypocrites, why you cleanse the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside they are full of extortion and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisees first cleanse the inside of the cup and the dish and the outside of them will also be clean. So we're dealing with a number of pictures here now that are very related. This is a picture of a bowl or a vessel. And scripture often talks about the vessel 
We are the vessel, and God is desiring to use us as vessels. And we're either a vessel of honor or a vessel of dishonor. And so we've got to make a decision in life. Are we going to be a vessel that can be used in a place of honor in God's house? Or are we going to be the vessel that's in a place of dishonor, like the spittoon in the toilet? Okay? Or do we want to be the vessel that he brings before his guests and he serves them? And so the Pharisees who are wearing masks and pretending to be something that they're not are really focused primarily on outside appearance. Yeah. And this is what the work syndrome is. It's a lot of it's driven by what men see in me. Yeah. Not so much how does God see me, it's how do men see me. It's the fear of man. I'm living to please man. I'm living, I'm all about, I want to praise myself and boast, but I all want people to praise and boast in me too. And so... Jesus says, you, you need to focus on the inside of the bowl and what's there. And if that's really clean and cleansed, the whole bowl is classed as sanctified and cleansed. But if you have the outside of the bowl sparkly clean and the inside is still dirty and, you know, all of these rotten food scraps are in there, who wants to eat their food mixed in with rotten food scraps? Or, you know, there's all of this bacteria and everything that's gone on because it's not being cleaned. And you're going to get, like, diarrhea and all sorts of stuff going on. What? It's going to defile you. Yeah. Anyone that comes to you to eat or drink will be defiled. But when you cleanse the inside, whatever gets poured into you is a benefit to those around you. Yeah. Well, I shouldn't say whatever. As long as the things that God have poured into you is a benefit. But even if, even if good food is poured into that bowl, if it's defiled and there's bacteria and everything going on, you know, a little bit of leaven leaveneth the whole lump, Jesus yes. said. Yeah. And it starts to pollute everything. Yeah. Okay. And so then he goes on. Extortion is dealing with money. And they were doing things for money and, and, and all sorts of deceptive practices and everything. And self-indulgence is all about myself and fulfilling my own desires. So the inside of the bowl was ultimately, I have an agenda for me. Self-promotion. For me to benefit. If I don't benefit out of this personally, somehow I'm not going to be into it. Well, God said, could you please do this for me? It won't benefit you at all, but it's going to benefit them. And if it benefits them, then you'll be at least benefited by the, the peace of God. And, and I don't want that. I want to get my benefit. Mm. See, what's being driven is there's a, there's a self-centered agenda driving them to do good works. Very hard for us to acknowledge this stuff about ourselves. Yeah? Why? Because blind is pride. Superior pride is blind, but the, the blindest of pride. That's why Jesus calls, calls the Pharisees, you blind guides, you're so blind, you're not yeah. seeing this. Because their self-righteous pride had blinded them to the real reality of their soul. And that's why you just, you know, you come before the Lord humbly, like David, Lord. Reveal to me all of my sin. I confess all my sin, even the sins I don't know about. Lord, come. We yield, we surrender, we ask for the Holy Spirit to convict us. It goes on, verse 27. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like a whitewashed tomb, which indeed appears extremely beautiful outwardly, but inside is just dead men's bones, which are full of uncleanliness. Remember, if they touch the dead, they are defiled. And it's a picture. Inside, there is spiritually defiling things. That's what's being said here. Outside, it looks beautiful. Outside, it looks righteous. Outside, it looks godly. Outside, it looks good. But inside, there is these def this defiling death. And by the way, sometimes deep inside yourself, you're doing all your good works. And this is why what, it's like a drug. People do good works to try to suppress their own guilt or their own shame or their own pain. They're trying to make themselves feel better about themselves by doing all the good works. This is how this is working. Yeah. You can't heal yourself by doing good works. You've got to come before the Lord and confess Wrong attitudes, confess what's in your life, confess your secret sin, confess the things that you're struggling with and, and cry out, turn to God in faith and ask Him to come and intervene 
Don't live in a denial. Denial's a river in Egypt where God's people are all kept in bondage. And some of you get that, some of you don't. Denial. But denial is part of pride. And all of us have it. Again, I'm, I'll look at the mirror. I'm actually looking at the mirror over there. You guys, you guys aren't seeing yourself in the mirror. I see myself Big in the mirror. mirror the whole time I'm preaching. I think God did that on purpose, you know. It's interesting because, you know, they used to whitewash the tombs because some of the tombs, you know how you go to those cemeteries and they have the lawn cemeteries? Well, some of their tombs are like that. And there's a grave and it's just like this plaque on the ground and if they didn't whitewash it, people would walk over it and then you're defiled. Mm. Yeah, yeah. That's interesting. But what Jesus is saying here is they're whitewashing the outside, but the inside issues are not being dealt with. So, you know, I, I know people that are driven by their shame, by their guilt, by their self-condemnation, and because they want to feel like a better person, they start doing all these good things. And you know, you meet overseas, you travel, and you see these people, they're working with the poorest of the poor, and they're doing all of this stuff. You know, to make themselves feel like they are a wonderful person. Meanwhile, they're getting drunk every night. These were non-Christian people. They're getting drunk every night, and they're going off and they're taking drugs, and they're having wild parties, and they're just, you look at them, and they're messed up people. But they're sacrificing their whole life because it makes them feel like they're good. It's, it's like self-medication. You know, people use a drug to self-medicate to get rid of the pain that's inside. And this is why people become workaholics. Again, they find their identity in their work. They find their value in the work that they do. If you can find your value, like Mary gazing upon Jesus and being in his presence and listening to his voice... So that when Jesus speaks and says, Mary, could you go and get me a cup of tea? She hears the voice of Jesus and she does the work prepared for her and she goes and makes a cup of tea and comes back because Jesus led her to do that. Yeah. And meanwhile, Martha's not having any intimacy with Jesus and she's just getting frustrated and bitter and resentful at Mary. Jesus, tell Mary to help me out. She's not doing any of the work. But see, we've got to learn how to turn to the Lord with all of our issues he will be our peace. He will be our comfort. But we've got, to, we've got to come to Him in the midst of what we're going through. But what we often do, um, you know, it says in Romans 12, Brethren, I urge you by the mercies of God to bring your bodies as living sacrifices. This is the holy and worship, and ex sorry, the holy and acceptable worship that God is seeking, right? So the problem about a living sacrifice is we always call off the altar. Mm. Lord, I surrender to you. No, I don't. I want it back. Lord, I give you everything until tomorrow. <laughs> now, now, all of us do this, right? We know that we have to surrender something. We know that we have to put it on the altar and leave it dead. And we put it on the altar. And then we go back and take it off the altar again. It's a similar thing. There's these things we've got to come to the altar. We've got to bring out... You know, when you find you're... A, the self-medication, the workaholic thing. These people, they, they work and work and work and work until they lose their marriages, they lose their families, they, they lose their health. And so everything they were trying to build in the beginning, they actually start destroying in the end. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, in the church, you know, workaholic, we can't really relate to the church too much because it's like, like those workaholics out there. But you know, in the church, I've, I've met prayerholics. Now, prayer is a good thing. It's a good work, isn't it? We're created to do good works. Jesus said about the tithe and um, you know, tithing the mint and all this sort of stuff. That the Pharisees were so very much looking. I've got to make sure every little bit of mint, I tithe one tenth to the Lord, and I'm going to give one tenth of my tomatoes and one tenth. And they did they, 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 one tenth of everything, man. But they forgot the bigger things: justice and righteousness, etc. Because they're focused on these little tiny things going on. Mm. And so, in the church, prayer is a really good thing. But, you know, I, I can remember going to churches in South Korea. And they were praying like robots because it's their responsibility. I went to IHOP 
I went to IHOP years ago and it was powerful, awesome. The presence of God was there. And then a number of years later, I went back to IHOP and I felt that I was in a factory where there was all these machines working and that was their prayer room. Wow. And it's just like, and everyone's burning out. Everyone, they lost the joy of prayer. They lost the joy of worship. I talked to all of these IHOP students and they just, they, some of them said to me, I hate prayer. Wow. I hate prayer. Because we have to be in this prayer room all the time and it become a work. Again, sometimes it's an attitude that turns prayer into intimate encounter with the awesome God that created the universe, my Father. And I'm connecting with Him and I'm partnering with Him to see change and transformation in the nation. And there's a faith thing that goes on. Or it's, I'm praying because I need to be a good Christian. I'm praying because I was told to. I'm praying because my, my leader is going to make a phone call and say, why weren't you at the prayer meeting? Or something like that. <laughs> But see, prayer, a prayerholic is, is that they, they find their identity in the prayer, but they lose, as, as Jesus said to the Ephesian church, who is doing a lot of good works, he said, you've lost your first love. And because you've lost your first love, if you don't repent of that, repent of losing your faith, intimate relationship, connection with God, if you don't reconnect, I'll remove your lampstand. Your light, your spiritual light will go out. Your spiritual joy will disappear. And you'll keep doing the motions. It's often a bit of a joke, but apparently it's a true story that my wife told me. <laughs> and it makes it true. Yeah. I like all the Korean stories. My wife tells me lots of Korean stories. But anyway, so in, in Korea, they're amazingly committed to prayer. They're famous for it. Uh, in, the, in the 70s and the 80s, the globally famous, the prayer revival of South Korea, right? And that's good. When you do it with the right spirit, the right attitude, by faith, this is a powerful thing, and you're encountering God and you're bringing in the presence of God. But my wife told me this story about how they were having these prayer meetings every morning super early because people have to go to the prayer room in the church and then they have to go to work, right? So 5 a.m., they all turn up to pray. And so the pastor asks this old lady who's been living on the prayer mountain to please open up in prayer. She starts to pray. Five hours later, she finishes oh praying. God. She opens her eyes and the church is empty. Mm. No relationship with people. No considering people around about her. Something was disconnected there. You know, you, you pray. There's other people who want to pray. You are not the prayer meeting. <laughs> but but see, see, the thing was, she found her identity in prayer so much, and possibly everyone's looking at her at the great, as a great prayer warrior, and so she prays for five hours nonstop. No one else gets an opportunity to pray. But she probably walked away thinking, I'm awesome. Then you get the evangelismaholics. You know, there's some evangelismaholics, and praise God, I don't see any of them in this church at the moment. Because the evangelism are holy, they, they love the lost so much that they hate the church. Yeah, they hate Christians. Yeah. Oh, they're always with the sinners. But they do not love the people of God. Yeah. Mm. There's something really wrong there. Jesus said, by this all men will know that you are my disciples. Not by how you love the lost, although we must love the lost. God loves the lost and that is biblical. But he said, by how you love one another. Yes. Okay, so I'm not... Saying we shouldn't love the lost. Please don't hear me say that. We're talking about order of priorities in how we do things. Now, this is the thing. Yeah. Because true faith in God is not a mechanical work. It's a faith-based, intimate relationship. And to, to the language of yoking with Jesus and, and listening to his voice and doing what he asks us to do, that, that's relational. And it's very difficult for us sometimes to comprehend. We'd rather just get a rule book that tells us this is what you're going to do today. And so we live by the letter of the law, not the spirit of the law. Yeah. And when you live by the letter of the law, you come under the law. And the New Testament says, actually, the letter of the law, it's death. Mm. The spirit of the law brings life. And then you wonder why you've lost the joy of serving the Lord. You know, you worship a holy people on the, on the worship team. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, not, I'm, not trying to, I'm just throwing stuff out there. It's, all of us can do it. You know, you could be the Sunday school teacher or holic or something. I don't know. 
But what happens is you find your identity in what you do, and you're not actually finding your identity in God and your relationship with Him. And so you've lost your first love. The true power is lost. And then you just mechanically go on and keep doing what you've always been doing. That's why they joke about it. But again, it's not a joke. They say 80% of what goes on in churches today would continue to go on if, they took the, if God took the Holy Spirit out of the churches. Now, that's scary. The Holy Spirit leaves the church. The Holy Spirit is the one who in and through us is doing the works of God. You cannot do anything without the Holy Spirit that is of eternal significance. Yeah. That's how you yoke to Jesus is by being yoked to the Holy Spirit. But, you know, we'll just go on and keep doing everything. You know, thank you very much. The Holy Spirit left, but we didn't even recognize that he left. It's like the guy that leaves a party and no one cared about him, so they didn't know that he left. Now, seriously, we've got to go and start to think about this. Are we doing stuff in our own strength? Okay. So Jesus goes on. We're still in Matthew 23. Even so, this is about the whitewashed tombs full of dead men's bones. Even so, you are outwardly appear as righteous men, but inside you're full of hip hypocrisy and lawlessness. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you build tombs for the prophets. You adorn them with monuments the monuments of the righteous, and you say, if I'd lived in those days, the days of my forefathers, I would not have done what they did. And the blood of the prophets would not be on my hands. But then Jesus said, but you now are witness against yourselves that you are the sons of those who murdered the prophets. It's interesting. Mm. You know, we hear the Bible stories and we think to ourselves, well, if I was there in those Bible days, I wouldn't be doing what those guys are doing. Meanwhile, most of us are doing what those guys were doing. You know what I'm saying? It's like the mistakes that they made, we still do in the church today. Yeah. But we, we, we have this once upon a time way of thinking about the Bible and we don't know how to grab the principles of what was going on then and apply it into our lives now and then to put things in order now. Let's look at Ezekiel. Now, actually, let's first look at Acts 23. Verse 3. Acts 23, verse 3. Okay, I'll go back to verse 1, so I've got the story going on. Now, Paul, looking earnestly at the Sanhedrin, the Jewish council, and he said, Men and brethren, I've lived in all good conscience before God up until this day. And then the high priest Aeneas commanded those who stood by Paul to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul turned around and said to Aeneas, May God strike you, you whitewashed wall. For you sit to judge me according to the law, yet you command me to be struck contrary to the law of God. And those that stood by said, You are reviling God's high priest. And so Paul said, Oh, sorry, I didn't know that he was actually the high priest. For it is written, you shall not speak evil of the high priest. Paul knew that Jesus is the great high priest. Mm -hmm. This other guy was a hypocrite. Yeah. But he uses this term, May God strike you, you whitewashed wall. Wow. Okay, let's go to Ezekiel 13. So we've got whitewashed tombs and whitewashed walls going on. Ezekiel 13. Ten through sixteen. Verse ten through sixteen. Because indeed, because they have seduced my people, saying peace. He's talking about the foolish prophets. The foolish and the deceptive prophets. Because indeed, because they have seduced my people, saying peace, when there is in fact no peace, and one builds a wall, and they plaster it with untempered mortar. To plaster with untempered mortar is to whitewash it. That's what whitewashing is, okay? So these false prophets are running around saying to the people of Israel, 
Everything's good. God's a God of grace. Don't worry. Peace, peace, peace and blessing unto you. But in fact, there isn't going to be peace. In fact, there's problems coming. And what they're actually doing is they're getting whitewash on these walls. And it goes on. I say to those who plaster it with untempered mortar or whitewash that the whole wall is going to fall down. There will be flooding rain. Kind of sounds like what's going on outside before. There will be flooding rain and you, O great hailstone, shall fall and a stormy wind is going to tear this wall down. Surely, when the wall has fallen, will it not be said to you, where is the whitewash with which you whitewashed this wall? Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, I'm going to cause a stormy wind to break forth, and in my fury, and there shall be flooding rain in my anger, and great hailstones to consume it, and I'm going to break down this wall that you have whitewashed with untempered mortar, and I'm going to bring it down to the ground so that it has, so that its foundation will be uncovered, and it will fall, and then you will be consumed in the midst of it, and you will know that I am the Lord. Okay, and it goes on. So I'm going to explain whitewashing because I used to work at Coolum Gardens Caravan Park. And they had this brick fence that went around part of the caravan park. And it was a really old brick fence. And what had happened is there was a lot of fig trees that had been growing around the old fence. And uh, those fig trees' roots had gotten underneath the wall. And so this brick wall had cracks in it everywhere, okay? And so what we'd do is we'd run around with some mortar, which was, you know, with some cement, and you kind of run around with cement and you just try to make it look like there isn't cracks everywhere. And then we literally, because the, the new boss that I got, instead of getting white paint that costs a lot more money, he decided we're just gonna whitewash this thing, okay? And so, on top of the fact that you're kind of not really fixing the broken wall, you're just kind of covering up all the breaks in it to make it look better. And I actually whitewashed this whole wall. It's a lot of work. I could have done. The, I could have painted it with the same amount of work, but he saved some money, unfortunately. And so what happened? We got rainy season come along, and when rainy season came along, uh, there's a lot of rain, and the whitewash eventually washes off and the broken down crappy wall is exposed and, and 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 so the thing was if any great weight had been put on that wall or something like that that wall would have crumbled and so and it's again the plumb line is there because the walls are not true to plumb they're, they're not right they're not straight they're all crooked and they're broken and so what whitewashing does whitewashing covers up the true nature of what you are like mm. or the true nature it, it covers up the problem without fixing the problem yeah. and so what happens is when the storms of life come and they will come many of you know we've been through storms right if I can prophesy over your life between now and the grave storms are coming because God wants to expose what's behind the whitewash. He uses storms to do that. Right. And what happens is when the storms break out and there's pressure and there's floods, everything starts to crumble and collapse. Yeah, and people go, I don't know why my whole life fell apart when that happened. Well, your whole life fell apart because it wasn't firm on a firm foundation. Yeah. Because there was issues, but you've been covering up your issues because of pride self-defensiveness or denial so if we can move and this is the plumb line it's humility and it's easy for me to preach it even like in my heart right now i'm thinking wow glenn do you know what you're saying humility to acknowledge in our souls where there are actually issues that need to be dealt with and when someone else comes along and helps us see them Heaven help that person. I saw on Facebook the other day. There was this really awesome looking rooster. 
with an amazing rooster's coat. The second picture was a rooster that had every single feather pulled out of it. He looked like he'd been totally, totally wrecked. And he said, this is me after I spoke to my wife. <laughs> I won't say anymore. No, but the, the thing is, you know, um, sometimes we see what's there, but denial is we cover it up and we just pretend it's not there without dealing with it. That's the problem with the good works syndrome. We are created for good works, but then we've got to deal with our own issues so that it flows out of a healthy system. In the book of Jeremiah, he's talking to the Jewish people. He's prophesying to them, woe unto you, because he said, you are broken systems. Mm -hmm. And so what would happen uh, in the ancient world, because you know, the, you have long periods without rain and you can have drought. And they didn't have all the dam systems that we've got like today. They did have dams and different things, but not like we do today. What they'd actually do is they'd dig these holes deep into the ground and they'd get these clay systems. And the clay systems would be actually under the ground and the, and the rainwater would go into them and it would keep it nice and cool and clean. And even in some places, they actually dig into the rock and, they, and in the rock they build these huge big systems and they've got this in uh, Saudi Arabia because they only have one month of rain a year. One month. Wow. And it's all desert, right? So what are you going to do for drinking water and for all your crops for the other 11 months? They have a system of underground systems. Yeah. So it doesn't evaporate like a dam because it's really hot in the summer in Saudi Arabia, right? They're underground. It doesn't evaporate. They catch everything in the underground system and they never have a shortage of water. And I'll tell you what, that wasn't something that they just did over the last 50 years. This is ancient wisdom. But Jeremiah says, you are broken system. So can you imagine, you've got this underground system, that just as much as made of clay, but it's being cracked and broken. And all of this beautiful water gets poured into it, that when the summer is there and there's no rain and you want a good drink, you go to it and it's like, oh my goodness, it's empty. So God is pouring things into us, but it's through the cracks it all leaks out. And when we're under pressure, if we haven't dealt with those cracks in our character, in our nature, that's why we're doing the Plumb Line series, you know, trying to identify these things. If we can identify it, then instead of just getting a bit of whitewash over it, what we're doing is we're actually fixing the wall. And then actually God is going to build us and make us like stronghold people that can stand in the storm. Okay, let's finish the teaching there. I have one final point. One final point from the book of Revelation, chapter 4. John sees the throne of God. The 24 elders, the seraphim, the cherubim, they're in 24-7 praise and worship. Worthy, worthy, worthy of all praise and glory and honour. And then the 24 elders come before the throne. And they represent to us the redeemed saints of God. The 24 elders, you know what they do? They cast down their crowns. See, those crowns, Stephanos, Stephanos is not the diadem, the ruling king's crown, the Stephanos, the, the overcomer's crown, the victor's crown. Because they'd lived a life of overcoming, they'd passed the test. And they receive the reward of the overcomer. And they cast their crown down before the throne. You know why? Because if it wasn't for you, we never could have done it, Lord. Amen. All glory goes to you. All honour goes to you. Amen. In the vision that Zechariah has, and he sees the lampstand with the olive trees and the living olive oil coming into the lampstand and it's burning 24-7 with this anointing oil. And that represents the people of God burning with the holy fire because the oil of God's anointing is continually flowing in. And then he says, it's not by might, it's not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. 
This is when we're not doing it in the flesh, but we need God help me by your spirit. God lead me by your spirit. When we're starting to feel dry, you know what you need? Lord, fill me up with the spirit. Jesus said, when you're thirsty, come to me and drink. Yeah. And then it goes on. And he says this about the, the mighty mountain that stands there. He says, when you see that mighty mountain removed, and then when you see the plumb line in the hands of Zerubbabel, the king, and you see the, the final capstone placed where the temple has been fully built. The temple is the church. It's living stones, us. When the temple is built at the end of the age and the, the final part of the temple comes, They all start crying out, grace, 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 grace. In other words, it's only because of you, God, that we're able to do this. Mm. How do we tap into the grace of God? And the grace of God is there for us to do the good works of God. Mm. Heavenly Father, I just pray that we would get revelation, understanding of this, because I know I struggle with this message. I understood this message in my head. But I, in, in deep inside, I struggled with parts of it over the years, especially as an early young Christian missionary, because I was pushing myself, I was striving in the flesh, and I, I actually went for a burnout because I was trying to do the works of God myself, and I hadn't fully learned how to tune into God, how to let the anointing of God flow into my life, how to listen to His voice, and I hadn't learned about how to rest. Because actually it's in the resting we often start to hear his voice. We've got to rest from all the doing so that we can actually hear what he's saying. And then we can do what he's doing, yoked together with him. So Lord, I just pray for all my brothers and sisters here. I know that you've called them and created them to do great and mighty works. But I ask, Lord, for your grace over them to enable them, to help them in the process. And that your Holy Spirit would show them where they're doing it in the flesh and not in the spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.